Good evening. My name is Marie Wechter and I'm the Director of Events for New England Public Media. It is my pleasure to welcome you to here tonight. We're about to watch a 25 minute screener uh, or clip selections from the series Ali. These are meant to be an introduction to the series and we urge you to uh, visit NEPM.org um, and uh, connect to stream the whole series at your leisure. We're here tonight uh, for this great conversation about Ali and social change. When we had the opportunity to further engage the community around the series, we thought that Springfield College would be the logical partner. They have such an incredible legacy and culture of, um, of, of connecting the dots and supporting um, education and leadership and athletics. I want to thank Dr. Calvin Hill and David McMahon at Springfield College who uh, embraced the idea and, um, and, and, and its results in this great event tonight. So you'll watch the 25 minute clip. When we come back, Dr. Calvin Hill and David McMahon will introduce our speakers for the evening and we hope you enjoy. Thank you. Do you want some breakfast? I want some food. Can I have some of your food? Oh, I don't want none. I won't take none. I won't take none. I won't eat none if you don't want to. Oh, look at that pretty horse. Oh, you got a white horse? See? Now stand up. Look over there. Stand up. You got to stand up over that field. See the big one? There he is. My earliest memories that I can think of as a child with my father are walking through airports and being in crowds and, and feeling in my the vibrations of people's clapping and shouts in my chest. And just looking at my dad, you know, like, who is this person? And it was all the time, anywhere we went, you're the greatest, we love you, and the clapping, and Mohammed. Abu Abu I loved feeling all the energy and the love that he felt. We now think of Muhammad Ali as this vulnerable guy lighting the torch in Atlanta and everybody on the globe loves him. Black people like him, white people. He's a universal hero like, but almost in a religious way, like the Buddha. But when he was in the midst of his career, and not just in the early bit, he was incredibly divisive. Boo, yell, scream, throw peanuts, but whatever you do, pay to get in. People hated him, whether it was along racial lines, class lines, Vietnam lines, political lines, religious lines, where they just couldn't stand him. And people, of course, had the opposite, and this was, I loved him, loved him. But you had an opinion about him. Hey, what do you want? I ain't scared to battle. You're gonna take a good man to whoop me. You can look at me, I'm loaded in confidence. I can't beat me. I had a 180 hours to fight, one or two steps to fight, and I'm as good as a girl. Look how pretty I am. My own trim legs and my beautiful arms and a pretty nose and mouth. I know I'm a pretty man. I know I'm pretty. You don't have to tell me I'm pretty. I'm cocky, I'm proud. You never talk about who's gonna stop me. Well, ain't nobody gonna stop me. I say what I wanna say. Ain't no more big talk like this. He was a pioneer. He was a revolutionary. He was a groundbreaker. A guy known simply as the greatest. I am the greatest. I've wrestled with alligators. I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail. You know I'm bad. I can drown a drink of water and kill a dead tree. This will be no contest. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. I'm away, I'm away. To have that chutzpah and to be a black man in America was just, it was outlandish. Muhammad means worthy of all praises and Ali means most high. And I just don't think I should go 10,000 miles from here and shoot some black people that never caught me. I just can't shoot it. I always wonder why Miss America was always white. Santa Claus was white. White swan soap, king white soap, white cloud tissue paper, and everything bad was black. Black cat was the bad luck, and if I threaten you, I'm gonna blackmail you. <laughs> 
So Mama wanted to call it white male. They lied too. I love being around him. I love being around Muhammad Ali. You gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Ah, rumble, young man, rumble. Ah. The price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. Freedom, freedom, I can't move. Freedom, cut me loose. The winner and still heavyweight champion. I He called himself the greatest, and then proved it to the entire world. He was a master at what is called the sweet science, the brutal and sometimes beautiful art of boxing. Heavyweight champion at just 22 years old, he wrote his own rules, in the ring and in his life, infuriating his critics, baffling his opponents, and riveting millions of fans. At the height of the civil rights movement, he joined a separatist religious sect whose leader would, for a time, dominate both his personal life and his boxing career. He spoke his mind and stood on principle even when it cost him his livelihood. He redefined black manhood, yet belittled his greatest rival using the racist language of the Jim Crow South in which he had been raised. Banished for his beliefs, he returned to boxing an underdog, reclaimed his title twice, and became the most famous man on earth. He craved adulation his whole life, seeking crowds on street corners, in hotel lobbies, on airport tarmacs, everywhere he went, and reveled in the uninhibited joy he brought each adoring fan. He earned a massive fortune, spent it freely, and gave generously to family, friends, even strangers, anyone in need. Service to others, he often said, is the rent you pay for your room here on Earth. Even after his body began to betray him and his brain had absorbed too many blows, he fought on, unable to go without the attention and drama that accompanied each bout. Later, slowed and silenced by a cruel and crippling disease, he found refuge in his faith, becoming a symbol of peace and hope on every continent. Muhammad Ali was, the novelist Norman Mailer wrote, the very spirit of the 20th century. I'm always going to be one black one who got big on your white televisions, on your white newspapers, on your satellites, million dollar checks, and still look you in your face and tell you the truth and 100% stay with and represent my people and not leave them and sell them out because I'm rich and stay with them. That was my purpose. I'm here and I'm showing the world that you can be here and still free and stay yourself and get respect from the world. One day in October of 1954, 12-year-old Cassius rode his bicycle into downtown Louisville while Rudy sat on the handlebars. It began to rain and the boys took cover in the Columbia Auditorium where a home appliance show was underway. After the rain stopped, they emerged to find that the bicycle was gone. He had a brand new Schwinn, a beautiful red bicycle that uh, he shared with his brother. And he went running around looking for his bicycle and then ran back into the community center asking for help. Someone told him there was a police officer in the basement. He went down and the cop in the basement was this Joe Martin who was running a little boxing school. Cassius told the story years later that for a minute he forgot about his bike because the sight of this boxing gym, the smell of the leather and the sweat, and the excitement, the action of boys in, in a ring hitting each other, black and white, together. 
And he, you know, reported the crime, and I'm going to get the guy, and I'm going to, you know, kill him. Joe Martin said, well, um, do you know how to fight? Fight. And that was the beginning. Though his father was reluctant to let his son train with a white police officer, the lessons were free, and Cassius was eager to learn. At first, the young boxer did not impress Martin. He was just ordinary, the trainer recalled, and I doubt whether any scout would have thought much of him. Cassius didn't show any special talent right away, but he showed enormous passion. He knew instantly that this was what he wanted to do. Boxing was perfect for him because there's just two guys in the ring, and your eye is always going to be drawn naturally to the one who's doing the most moving, who's doing the most punching, who's moving the fastest. And that was him, and he knew that he could get the most attention that way. Just six weeks after he walked into Joe Martin's gym, Cassius Clay had his first amateur fight. I, at that time, was putting on a local television show here in Louisville, and I had uh, amateur bouts every Saturday afternoon. The first bout I put him in, he weighed 87 pounds. After defeating 14-year-old Ronnie O'Keefe in a split decision, Clay immediately announced to everyone that one day he would be called the greatest of all time. He was always been a little bragging. I'm the greatest and all that before he even got to be the greatest. We'd say, oh, shut up, precision run in your mouth. But as he got better and better, we had more respect for him. After four fights abroad, Ali's promoters had finally managed to secure an American venue, the Astrodome in Houston, Texas, a brand new and first of its kind dome stadium, dubbed the eighth wonder of the world. Ali had agreed to fight Cleveland Big Cat Williams, an army veteran who'd once been shot by a police officer during a drunk driving arrest. Williams had knocked out 51 of his 71 opponents. It would be the largest audience for an indoor boxing match in history. I think his masterpiece is with Cleveland Williams. That's Picasso, right? That's Brushnikov, right? That's Miles Davis. He throws like a 10 punch combination. He's going backwards, man. Now look. <laughs> look, I don't know how to define that. I'm not a scientist, but like that, I kind of like, you know, artistry will never be seen again. When he did that, um, it looked effortless. And uh, it looked like um, he came out of the womb doing that. Introducing a new move he dubbed the Ali Shuffle, he peppered Williams with jab after jab as the big cat struggled to land the single punch. Ali floored his challenger three times in the second round. It was a two-fisted assault of vicious effectiveness, wrote frequent critic Arthur Daly, who declared that Ali had won over all the doubters. A minute into the third round, the referee ended the fight. Two weeks later, an all-white Houston jury found Ali guilty of refusing the draft. The judge, ignoring the more lenient recommendation of the prosecutor, sentenced him to the maximum, five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. And he would have to surrender his passport. Ali's lawyers immediately filed an appeal, prepared to go all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary a process that could take years. Ali remained free, but without his title or a license to box. He fully expected that he would one day go to jail for his beliefs. 
we, who are followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, we believe in obeying the laws of the land. We are taught to obey the laws of the land as long as it don't conflict with our religious beliefs. Will you go into service as such? This would be a thousand percent against the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, and the Holy Quran, the holy book that we believe in. This will all be denouncing and defying everything that I stand for. This would mean, of course, that you stand the chance of going to jail as a result of not going into service. You well, whatever the punishment, whatever the persecution is for standing up for my religious beliefs, even if it means facing machine gun for that day, I will face it before denouncing Elijah Muhammad and the religion of Islam. I'm ready to die. When I think about him saying, if they want to put me before a firing squad tomorrow, I'm ready to die before I abandon my religion. Um, that's it. You can't teach that kind of thing in lectures, in books. That kind of thing has to be modeled. And models turn into traditions. And traditions provide people with the mechanical memory to do the right thing. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. I mean, anybody now faced with a major decision in which the right way is clear and the wrong way is clear, but the consequences are dire, now they have a model that they can fall back on psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. And that, to me, that moment will live on forever. The court unanimously threw out the conviction of boxer Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay. On June 28, 1971, as Ali was leaving a corner store on the south side of Chicago, the shopkeeper heard the news and ran after him to let him know. Well, I was on 7th and 8th Street on the south side and just bought me orange in the grocery store and the grocery owner came out and grabbed me and hugged me with tears in his eyes, a little black fella, and told me, that you've just been vindicated and you free, eight judges all voted in your favor. And he just hugged me and squeezed me. And... How do you feel about our system now? Well, I don't know who will be assassinated tonight. I don't know who will be enslaved or mistreated. I don't know who will be deprived of some other justice or equality. So I can't say nothing. All I can talk about is my case. And I'm thankful that the courts recognized my sincerity and my beliefs in this case. It was so beautiful. Oh, that was beautiful. I cried because it was, it, I was so happy. My brother, my brother faced a prison, a prison sentence. He was found guilty. He wasn't found guilty. They let him go. He was right. The Supreme Court said he's right. It's just so beautiful. It showed, it showed there's a God. It was easy for me. It was easy. You know why? Because he knew in his mind he was doing the right thing. Do the right thing in life, you're happy. No matter what people say. Do what you think is right. Somebody asked me once in, in high school, what do you think about the war in Vietnam and maybe going over there and fighting? And I said, listen, I can't see any reason I'd be shooting these Vietnamese men and women. Why, why would I be doing that? Why would I go there? Why would I support that? Uh, I thought it was my own thought. That shows how powerful Muhammad Ali is. It was a thought that I had gotten from him, but I didn't even know I got it from him. When he says, no Viet Cong ever called me, I mean, somehow that got into my head, but I, not, on, not on purpose, not consciously. And that's a real leader. He influences you, and you don't know what's happening. His devotion to Islam increasingly shaped his daily routine. He prayed five times each day, facing Mecca, called friends to discuss the differences between religions, and distributed autographed pamphlets that he hoped would help correct common misperceptions about his faith. 
When he traveled in the Muslim world, massive crowds greeted him as Muhammad Ali Clay to distinguish their hero from thousands of faithful Muslims also named Muhammad Ali. During a goodwill visit to Pakistan in 1987, Muhammad and Lani visited schools, hospitals, and mosques. They delivered canned milk to an Afghan refugee camp along the border and encouraged guerrilla fighters there in their long struggle to evict the occupying Soviet army from Afghanistan. He needed love like he needed air to breathe. So the people did probably more for him than he did for them, if not at least equal. You know, so he was so grateful for the love they gave. He was so grateful for that. In 1989, he was on the road more than at home, visiting England, Senegal, Switzerland, and Saudi Arabia. In April, he and Lani made a pilgrimage to Mecca during the holy month of Ramadan. Ali had visited Mecca before in 1972, but now admitted that he hadn't fully appreciated its significance and acknowledged that his commitment to his religion had long been imperfect. I fit my religion to do whatever I wanted. I did things that were wrong and chased women all the time. Everything I do now, I do to please Allah. One of my father's favorite sayings was, rivers, lakes, and streams all have different names, but they all contain water. So do religions have different names, but they all contain truth. He always taught me that there's only one true religion, and that's the religion of the heart, he would say. And as long as you do right and you treat people right, you know, I believe you'll go to heaven no matter what you call your religion. Ali, late in life, talked about this tallying angel, he called it, that there was an angel up there who counted all the good things you did in life and all the bad things you did in life. And if you had more bad things than good things, you were going to hell. And he had a very vivid impression of what hell meant. And he acknowledged that he had a lot of negative marks, that the tallying angel was not going to be uh, happy with the way he had treated women in particular. Thirty years after Ali first faced Joe Frazier, a reporter asked him about their long-running feud. I called him a lot of names that I shouldn't have called him, Ali admitted. I apologize for that. I like Joe Frazier. Me and him was a good show. Frazier never forgave Ali. Later, he expressed sorrow at having abandoned Malcolm X. Turning my back on Malcolm was one of the mistakes that I regret most in my life, he wrote. I wished I'd been able to tell Malcolm I was sorry that he was right about so many things. Daddy evolved, he became better. And Daddy said that I'm bigger than boxing. That meant boxing was this much His evolution into the person he is today is way bigger than him just boxing. And I think he knew that. And he carried it with him, his love. And he gave it to every single person he met. And I think that's beautiful. As the 20th century came to an end, Newsweek, Time, and Sports Illustrated all named him Athlete of the Century. In the days after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, American Muslims were the victims of hate crimes simply because of their faith. I am a Muslim. I am an American, Ali responded. If the culprits are Muslim, they have twisted the teachings of Islam. Whoever performed the terrorist attacks does not represent Islam. God is not behind assassins. What I hope is that Muhammad Ali will be a constant reminder uh, uh, to America of just how thoroughly American a believing, practicing, sincerely committed Muslim can be. Whatever one's background is, Ali belongs to America, all of us. And I think that 
He belongs to all of us because he affected all of us. And I hope that that's part of the legacy that he will leave, that America won't forget Ali as this American Muslim with, with equal emphasis on American Muslim. On November 9th, 2005, President George W. Bush presented Ali with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. That same year, the Muhammad Ali Center, a museum dedicated to his life and legacy, opened in Louisville. Muhammad Ali was an activist who fought to reach us a certain way and to move America in a certain way, and to move individuals in a certain way. I'm going to take this path. I believe that I'm right. And even if I'm not right, I'm still me. And to be able to follow that and to know that there was going to be an enormous price to pay for that and to have that be generational, to have that live on beyond you is extremely valuable. Everything that he did couldn't be undone. My name is Calvin Hill, and I serve as the Vice President for Inclusion and Community Engagement at Springfield College. I hope that you enjoyed that short clip and that it has excited you to learn more about the late, great Muhammad Ali. Springfield College's mission and our long and rich history of engagement around issues of social justice positioned us well to work with New England Public Media this evening to host this virtual conversation, where we will use the themes from the documentary to address issues around the broad premise of social change. Our college mission is to educate students in spirit, mind, and body for leadership and service to others. We do this through our academic offerings, co-curricular programs, and numerous partnerships within Springfield, which allow our students to engage and serve the public good. As the birthplace of basketball, we also happen to know a little bit about sport. As such, we believe that Mr. Ali embodied the ideals of both sport and social justice. He was indeed bigger than boxing and larger than life. Before I turn it over to our moderator who will introduce our panel, I do want to thank those that made this evening possible. Marie Wechter, New England Public Media, Chloe Kugius, WETA, President Mary Beth Cooper and Kathy Martin, Office of the President here at Springfield College, Damon Markowitz and the Springfield College Media Relations Team. Jonathan McGibbon, our Springfield College Media Service Technician, and David McMahon, who will lead our question and answer period following our moderated conversation. So please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your questions. Okay, everyone. Let me introduce this evening's moderator, my friend and colleague, Professor Martin Dobrow. Marty has been at Springfield College since 1999. He's the author of two books and a third on the way. In addition to being an outstanding educator, his freelance credits include work in The Atlantic, The Boston Globe, and ESPN.com. Six of his stories have earned recognition in the best American sports writing series. I can think of no better person to moderate this evening's conversation, Professor Marty Dobrow. Marty? Calvin, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Thank you, Marie, and all the good folks at New England Public Media for setting this up and thanks of course to our audience for being here to see both a tantalizing clip of that terrific and very important documentary and also for taking in this panel discussion we are about to have with Sarah Burns and with Gerald Early. Uh, it was probably inevitable that the brilliant documentary filmmaker Sarah Burns would eventually make her way to Springfield College in Springfield, Massachusetts, even though she's here virtually tonight. Um, but this was a, a date with destiny in a sense. Uh, for one thing, uh, she is married to David McMahon. No, 
not our David McMahon, our eloquent and deep-hearted director of spiritual life who will be handling the Q&A later tonight, but David McMahon, who is a formidable filmmaker in his own right, we had a chance to meet him briefly before the presentation, just a delightful, energetic, bright light of a, a human being and what a great creative partnership they have. But beyond that coincidence, there has been some remarkable overlap in Sarah Burns' creative projects and the small campus and surrounding area. Last year, for instance, uh, we had an amazing presentation on campus from Youssef Salam, one of the members of the Central Park Five, the five young men who had been wrongfully convicted and jailed in the brutal rape of the Central Park jogger from 1989. And many of you, I think, are familiar uh, possibly with Sarah's great 2011 book about the case, and certainly with the remarkable documentary film, The Central Park Five, that she co-produced and directed with her husband, David McMahon, and some other guy who knows uh, a thing or two about documentary filmmaking, uh, her father, Ken Burns, was an absolutely brilliant and haunting and very, very important film. Uh, then there is Sarah Burns' connection with Jackie Robinson who famously broke the color line in Major League Baseball in 1947. Um, 15 years later, after he got into the Baseball Hall of Fame, he came here to Springfield College in 1962 and spoke. Uh, and there was a picture that was taken of him that night by a Springfield College graduate by the name of Spiro Kolakis and, and hangs uh, in a couple places. One is the Smithsonian Institute and one is right over Dr. Hill's uh, left shoulder there. I hope you can see that. It's just an amazing photo. And based on that uh, coincidence, perhaps we were able to get a pre-screening of the great Jackie Robinson documentary in 2016, made again by uh, Sarah Burns, Ken Burns, and David McMahon. Um, then, of course, there's this Muhammad Ali thing, right? Now, Muhammad Ali also has, believe it or not, connections to this area. Uh, in 1964, uh, February of 1964, uh, when he started out as Cassius Clay, won the heavyweight championship in a stunning upset over Sonny Liston, became Muhammad Ali, uh, there became an interesting connection with our campus uh, that was this. Uh, later that year, there was an appearance of another civil rights icon, Martin Luther King, on our campus as a graduation speaker amid some amazing circumstances in June of 64. And then Muhammad Ali, who had already been to Springfield a few times uh, in the early 60s, came back. It was actually the next year, early in 65, when he was training for the rematch with Sonny Liston. And where did he train? Right before that heavyweight championship fight, he chained, trained right on the Chicopee Springfield line, was here for several days, staying at a place called the Shine Inn, S-C-H-I-N-E, Inn, that later became, and you can't make this stuff up, called the Plantation Inn. Uh, there's ample documentary record of that. And then a few days later, up in Maine, uh, Muhammad Ali knocked out Sonny Liston in the first round. So Sarah Burns has just been connected to us all along, and so it seems appropriate. And so Sarah, we would like to first welcome you, and we'll uh, you can put on your camera and say hello if you would. Hi, thank you for that lovely introduction. Great, great to see you. And we are also joined by one of the nation's most eloquent cultural critics, a, a brilliant writer and editor, someone who has been a consultant for many of the great documentaries by Team Burns and McMahon, um, a record of America that is really, I think, unequaled in its, its eloquence. And that person is Gerald Early, who is the Merle King Professor of Modern Letters of English at Washington University in St. Louis, where he has taught since 1982. Um, after earning his doctorate in English literature at Cornell University. He has been an absolutely prolific writer on many, many topics, uh, among them sports and race. Uh, two of his many uh, publishing credits include The Culture of Bruising, Essays on Prize Fighting, Literature and Modern American Culture, and 
a level playing field, African-American athletes and the Republic of Sports. So welcome to you, Professor Early. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. And we were supposed to have a third uh, member for this panel discussion, unfortunately could not make it because of travel commitments. And that's Nancy Lieberman. And she is someone that many in the Springfield College community might be familiar with because Nancy is a basketball legend and basketball is obviously a sport that we know a thing or two about on this campus. And she was absolutely uh, a pioneer figure in, in women's basketball and has just continues to be. And uh, I do a podcast with one of our, our recent graduates, Chris Rim. It's called Liberty, Justice, and Ball. And it's on the intersection of basketball and social justice. And we've had a number of great guests, including Jerry West this week, and uh, just a number of fantastic guests. And Nancy Lieberman was one of them. And when she spoke to us and we're talking about her role models, interestingly, the person who she said was most important to her was none other than Muhammad Ali. Let's take a listen to that, that a short clip from that podcast, if we could. <clears throat> with all the turbulence in your your family, uh, with with your mom, with your dad, not feeling a lot of support for who you were, uh, you turned to a very interesting role model who became a role model for you really throughout his life, and I guess maybe continues to be Muhammad Ali. And was wondering if you could share the story of how you first connected with Muhammad Ali, why he was important, what role he played in your sense of yourself? Well, I had a couple uh, role models in the basketball world with her, Walt Frazier, Willis Reed with the Knicks. I've worn number 10 my entire career because of Walt Frazier. And also Dr. J. Julia Serving was, you know, he was the best of the best at that time. You know, the things that he could do on, on the court but it really was Muhammad Ali that had a forever lasting impact on me because he was bold. He said what he felt. He backed up what he said. And it seemed like he had a game plan. And when, he, when somebody in that era says, I'm the greatest of all times, he had that swag. He just had something about him that empowered you. And I looked at him and I was like, man, I want to be like that. And that's where I want to begin our question tonight, from that quote. It was so interesting when she says at the, the end that there was something about him that empowered you. Something about him that empowered you. And I want to turn this to, to both to, to Sarah and to Professor Early. How would you define what that thing was, that thing about him that empowered you? Um, all right, I'll, I'll go first. Um, you know, I think that's absolutely right that the, he had an authenticity about him. Um, you know, we sometimes think of, especially in the early years of his boxing career of Muhammad Ali, at that time Cassius Clay, as this sort of um, bragging, brash, loud, you know, make, perhaps overconfident. You know, he was saying that he was the greatest before he had really proven that yet though he would go on to do it. Um, and that, you know, I think a lot of people saw that as ego, um, as hubris, you know, but I think that there's this important thing, even in those early days, that it did have this way of um, giving other people permission to feel proud of themselves. Um, to him saying, I'm so pretty, I'm beautiful. And when you think about what's going on in, you know, this is in the early 1960s, that for him as a black man to say, I'm beautiful, I'm so pretty, was I think in a way giving other people permission to feel that way about themselves. And I think that that has a, a huge impact, even though I think some people read it as just him bragging and him uh, talking about himself. I think that it had an impact on other people and I think he knew that. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. That's, uh, I think, what uh, Ali or the young Cassius Clay had going for himself was that he was uh, young, he was good looking, um, he was uh, very good at his sport, he was a very attractive person. In the early 1960s, he was a kind of unique figure 
uh, as a black athlete at that moment. Um, and he was in a sport that, that emphasized being an individual and he brought a certain kind of style to it. And he also had um, a great sense of humor. So while he had this enormous ego, um, which I think was the first word that Norman Mailer used in an essay about him, I think the first word he said was ego, um, that uh, he also had an, an, a great sense of humor and a great sense that a lot of time he was saying stuff that was sort of tongue in cheek a little bit. And, um, and I think that made him not only empowering the people, but I think what made him empowering the people was that because of the humor and everything else and, and the skill that he had, I think he seemed um, both charismatic, but at the same time approachable. Um, there was something about him that was endearing you know, in, in a lot of ways to people. And I think that what made him unique as a, as a uh, public figure in America at that time. Mm. Very, very interesting points on, on both fronts. Yeah, there's certainly something just charming, eloquent. I mean, that's, I loved, I mentioned to this to, to Sarah um, before we started, that opening clip of the film is just so delightful, so well wrought with his, his daughter there stealing the corn pops. And, and just, you get a sense of just how magnetic, how loving, how playful. Um, it's just a very, very short clip, but I, th I just thought it was a brilliant way to, to open up to the, the deep humanity of this person who you're trying to render in a really full way. Um, I wanted to ask you, Sarah, uh, you know, your family, I mean, you've chronicled so much about Amer America. Uh, we see demographic shifts that are enormous in our country. We see and you know, ongoing tensions that are just, I mean, so present, you know, even today, even this week, election day, uh, you know, some of the trials that are, are taking place right now in, in Kenosha and, and Charlottesville and Atlanta. I mean, this is, this is all just, just right here, right now. Backlash against racial progress just seems to be constant. You grew up in, in New, small town New Hampshire. Uh, it, I did a quick little bit of research before this about sort of demographics of different states. And New Hampshire is, is not at the very bottom, but it's it's certainly one, one of the, the smallest representations of people of color yeah. in, the, in the, the country. Yet you obviously have been drawn for so long to issues of sort of racial and social justice. Where does that, that come from, would you say? Mm. It's true. Um... Yeah, I, I think I always have. And I certainly I'm sure a lot of that comes from just growing up around my dad's work. I mean, I, hi, Gerald, uh, have known Gerald since I was a fairly young child. I have fond memories of uh, the consultant screenings for my dad's baseball film, which Gerald served as a consultant and was a was interviewed for that film. Um, and me at, you know, nine, 10 years old coming and watching screenings and, you know, giving my sharing my comments as a 10 year old. Um, and so I, you know, I grew up with these stories and I grew up with this sense of um, the importance of telling those stories. Um, Jackie Robinson was an early hero of mine, thanks to that project and, and learning his story. Um, and so I think it's something that was in the air in my family, certainly thinking about injustice. Um, I think I was always a kid who had a very strong sense of fairness and probably my parents would say too much so. Um, but I think that always was, it was around. Um, and when I went to college, I'd initially thought I would major in film studies. And I started and I took the intro course in film studies and I, it wasn't the right fit. And so I started kind of flipping through the course book, trying to figure out what else I was going to major in. And it was all the American studies courses that really captured my interest to just, oh, this would be fun. I would like to take this one and this one and this one. And so I tried out American studies and, and fell in love with that. And I ended up majoring in American studies with a concentration in race, sort of mostly somewhere between American studies and African American studies for my major. And with, to be honest, no sense at that time as I was choosing those courses uh, that I was switching from the medium of my dad's work to the subject of it. 
I didn't, it didn't occur to me at the time that that's what was going on. It was just, this is what seemed interesting and important. Um, and so that's been, I think, always, always an interest of mine. Um, the injustice that is so clear. Uh, I think as soon as you start to study America, you see uh, these great flaws going back to the very beginning. And if you're interested in telling stories about this country, there's sort of, that's it. That's where, that's where you have to go. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, that's where, I mean, that's the, the heart of social justice work. When you say that you have this, have this sort of ingrained, quote unquote, strong sense of fairness. I think that's sort of the adult's job. Like we know that, that the world is unfair. I mean, that's kind of a given for all of our, you know, the lovely promises in our founding documents. I mean, we see that unfairness around us, all around us. And I think that the, the job of adults, probably more than any, is to try and make the world more fair. Uh, and I mean, kudos to both of you who have just been, uh, you know, bending that arc of the moral universe with all of your might for, for a long time. I, I wonder for you, Professor Ali, if that sense of fairness, unfairness, inequity, when were you, when did you become aware that this was going to be a real driving force in your life? Well, I believe that um, when I was a boy, I think it was pretty apparent. Um, my family was um, uh, fairly um, uh, activists. And um, I had um, aunts who were involved with the civil rights movement. My sister, my oldest sister was a member of SNCC. And um, so I kind of was uh, surrounded by uh, a lot of these issues. Also, um, when I was young, um, I learned about America and in school. And I came away thinking that I lived in a really extraordinary country. And the concept of freedom and the concept of what the country was impressed me enormously. And so I thought that this seemed to be a country worth fighting for. I mean, it seemed to be a country worth fighting for to make it better because it seemed to believe in the possibility that it could be better. And so um, uh, I would say that, um, you know, my family, uh, the people I was around growing up, and also um, just uh, the teachers that taught me in school. And when I was in elementary school learning about America and so forth, all the teachers I had were black and the students were all black. And um, yeah, we came away with thinking that this was a special place and that black people occupied a special place in a special place. <laughs> yeah, I think that idea of just, you know, this possibility that it could be better and pushing for the, you know, the beloved community for the more perfect union. You know, the, of course, again, the, the famous King quote about the, the arc of the moral universe. I mean, but it's, it's always such a struggle. Like every generation, it seems that they have to take on the mantle of that, that struggle. And it, it's had so many different incarnations over the years. Uh, the one that it seems to be most present this week is this these quote unquote you know referendums on the teaching of critical race theory and i'm curious what the two of you make of that and what you think maybe muhammad ali would have made of that gerald you go first on that one easy question right <laughs> well i think that uh, muhammad ali when he became a member of the nation of islam really introduced a kind of um, proto or um, introductory sort of critical race theory, because what upset people a lot about what he was saying was um, that he was saying these kind of truths about the country um, when he had become a Muslim. And, and he became a Muslim and he said, look, I had gone around um, my whole life and I had been sort of asleep. And now I joined this group and I've become awakened. It wasn't just awakened through the faith, but it was so the faith opened up this realization about politics and about what the country was. And so um, I think in some ways that his insistence about um, what uh, what happened in the country, about the racism in the country being so outspoken about it, doing little things like the thing with the 
the little the clip that showed he was talking about black and what you know you have black male and all this sort of stuff. You know, but y'all call it white male because <laughs> white people, <laughs> white people are dishonest too. Um, but you know, all of this was kind of uh, meant to kind of undermine or subvert um, the standard story about America and the standard story about race. So in some ways, he kind of was on this huge stage in popular culture and introduced in some ways a kind of, uh, as I said, um, um, beginner's version of a critical race theory about the, the minority person seeing experience of being American as a different thing and as, but a, a thing that is absolutely essential if America is going to understand itself. So um, I would think that he would now uh, probably feel it's fine about critical race theory. I would think also with his, as he developed his faith as he got older, I would also think he would not want it to be a divisive issue. He would hope that everyone could come together with critical race theory and find um, in this truth about the country um, that everyone could become better as a result of realizing this truth about the country, that whites and black. I don't think he would be interested in wanting to make whites feel bad or guilty or necessarily say, oh, you're cosmic villains. I would think you find this out and it will help make you a better person. I would think that that's what he would think. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree. I think that, you know, I mean, the reality is that it's so important right now, especially given these really quite ridiculous conversations that are being had, I think, about critical race theory, um, that it's more important than ever to teach this history and to understand our history. Um, because that, even just the simple teaching of the realities, the unvarnished truth of American history is under attack right now. I think that the people who are fearful of and critical of critical race theory couldn't actually tell you what that means or what it is, or point to a place where it's being taught to any child in, who's not, you know, in college, at least. Um, and so really what, what people are saying is that we should not confront the truths of our history. Um, and I think that that is central to trying to make some of that progress, trying to, as you were saying, make this country better, trying to achieve some of those ideals that we had at our start that we have never actually achieved. And I don't think you can do that if you can't confront where we've been and what we've gotten wrong. Um, and that's a big part of why we do what we do, because I think that understanding these stories and understanding um, the challenges that we've faced and how they echo in the present always, no matter what film we make, you know, we started making, people keep saying, oh, this is very timely. You know, we started making this film, we decided to make this film, what, eight years ago? Um, you know, before Black Lives Matters, before, you know, any of these conversations we're having today. But no matter what, when you choose a subject and you look at our history through this kind of lens, uh, it's going to be relevant. Yeah, I mean, sadly, it does stay relevant, you know, with each passing day. And it's, uh, again, I mean, you want, I think, to believe that in the, over the long haul, that there's progress, that the graph is up. But, but clearly, there are many moments of backlash. Uh, Muhammad Ali lived a lot of that in, in the, the 60s. I mean, certainly, you look at that, that rich and juicy time period when he became heavyweight champion, the context around the edges of that is just, just extraordinary. I mean, that was February of 64. That was you know, a few months after the Kennedy assassination, it was not long after the, the March on Washington, you know, it was just a few months before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. I mean, just an absolutely extraordinary time of sort of hope and heartbreak, double-edged intensity of America. And I wonder if we could sort of revisit that a little bit because Professor Early, you, you um, referenced the, uh, Muhammad Ali is sort of joining the Nation of Islam as sort of a moment where of his sort of political and racial awareness. Um, this has been really present in the, the culture recently. We saw that, you know, interesting movie, One Night in Miami that, you know, pulled together 
Muhammad Ali and, you know, Jim Brown and Sam Cooke, uh, you know, and obviously Malcolm X as well. As you look at it, that connection between Malcolm and Muhammad Ali, I know that there was the little clip that we saw at the end where we saw how, you know, Ali was feeling some real regret about distancing himself from, from Malcolm. How do you think that, that should have gone? How do you think Malcolm felt about that loss? I know he wasn't around for much longer. He was assassinated the next year in 65, but, but what sense do you make of it from the distance of so many years? I think that um, Malcolm X was attracted to uh, Muhammad Ali because he, or Cassius Clay, because he saw him as someone who could be enormously um, influential with young Black people. He saw him as someone who could really be uh, a real force uh, because of his personality, because of his gifts as an athlete, because he brought together so many things that would make him so attractive to a mass audience of people. Um, and he wanted to have a mass audience of people attracted to him. So I think um, um, Malcolm X saw that. And he also saw, okay, here, here's someone who could be an example as this really awakened black athlete. Um, you know, someone who could go even beyond, let's say someone like Paul Robeson or something, it could really be this uh, uh, enormous figure and a, and a figure that could be international, not only because of the faith he adopted, but because the sport he was in also was a global sport. So he had this, you know, he could have these reverberations everywhere. So I think he saw him as a, a person of enormous gifts who could do who could do many many great things, um, and um, I'm not. I think that his relationship with Ali's relationship with Malcolm X was that they were he admired Malcolm X. He thought Malcolm X was very smart. He thought Malcolm X was very uh, a great speaker and was very. Um, um, had a great understanding of how racial politics worked in the world. Um, but I also think that he had, Muhammad Ali had great comfort in the nation of Islam. And the idea of leaving that, leaving that particular community, which gave him a lot of support and a lot of comfort and a, and a vision of the world, I think um, made him nervous, which is one of the reasons I think ultimately they broke apart because um, when, Malcolm X left, I think that Muhammad Ali was just really um, uh, uncomfortable with the idea of leaving and uncomfortable with what with the conflict that was going on between Ma Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam. And I think he decided he was going to stay with the nation because he thought it was the best route for him. He had this community. And Malcolm X, remember, once Malcolm X left, he was sort of alone. And I think that one of the reasons why Ali joined this faith community was when you join a community, like you don't want to be alone. You're here with a whole bunch of fellow believers who are giving you support and everything. And that's very important to him now that he's become outed as a Muslim, outed himself and everything that had that had this level of support um, with fellow believers. And the idea of leaving that so quickly to join Malcolm, I think really unnerved him. And I think he wouldn't do it. I think looking at it now, um, uh, in a way, you know, if he had left and joined um, um, Malcolm X, maybe Malcolm X would not have been assassinated. Maybe that whole thing would have played out quite differently if he had left and gone, because he would have brought with him uh, a lot of stuff that would have made it more difficult maybe for that to play out the way it did. One, one thing I haven't seen much written about is the uh, connection of Ali with Martin Luther King, obviously I, another iconic person in the civil rights movement. And, you know, I mean, King and Malcolm obviously were much more closely aligned and became, you know, converged in ways that, that I think, you know, sort of casual scholars of civil rights might not necessarily recognize. But be that as it may, I mean, King is certainly known as, a, you know, a great man of peace, a pacifist, uh, and here's Muhammad Ali, who is making his living and his fame in the most brutal of sports, but is also coming out with, with you know, very fervent, courageous, risky opposition to the Vietnam War. 
What sense do, do either or both of you have of the connection that Ali had with Dr. King? Well, there is a moment in the film where we see them together um, in some, some news footage when they have a meeting and it's not long, it's just a few days before King gives his famous anti-Vietnam speech at Riverside Church in New York and they're having a meeting about Ali's draft resistance at that time and about their sort of shared interest in this topic. And that's really where I think they um, converged was in this, um, their feelings about the Vietnam War. Um, you know, King was against the draft and was speaking out about that early on. Um, and Ali himself was taking this, as you said, very courageous stand. And so I think that that, um, you know, that's where they really had something in common and where they met and talked about and shared. And it's such a wonderful moment because you see in the span of a minute, um, Ali making King crack up and then also making him very uncomfortable when he puts his arm around him unexpectedly. It's sort of a funny moment. But um, I think also, you know, we sometimes people sometimes talk about um, Ali as a as a civil rights leader in some way. And I think that there are you know, he's such an important figure in that period and such a, you know, as an inspiration, certainly that courage and his draft resistance um, and what we were talking about earlier in terms of just his his pride and the way that he kind of projected that to so many people. But the reality is that he also, in joining the Nation of Islam, was joining a separatist group. Um, he was anti-integration. And I think it's important to remember that he and King really sharply diverged in that area, um, that Ali was someone who was looking at the segregation that he experienced as a child and his father's frustrations at um, not having the career opportunities he had wanted. Um, and he reacted by going by, I think, finding a kind of explanation, um, a way of looking at the world with Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. And that message was, we're going to create our own communities, our own businesses, and we don't need to go where we're not wanted. We're going to do this ourselves. Um, and that's a very different message than King's. These times that we live in now, I mean, obviously are, are very tumultuous, a tremendous sense of, of division, huge challenges that we are, are facing to, to you know, try to, to make the country a better place. I mean, I guess those challenges are ever present, but certainly when we look back at, at that era in the, the 60s, when Muhammad Ali was ascendant in the culture, I mean, one thing about that time, that stands out quite tragically are the number of uh, assassinations of, of great leaders. I mean, certainly Dr. King and Malcolm X, but not just them, JFK, Bobby Kennedy, Edgar Evers. What, what do we know about Ali's response to those, those heartbreaking moments of American history? Do you want to take that, Sarah? Sure. Well, I mean, we, you know, he he commented after King's assassination. Um, he called him his black brother um, in in mourning that event. Um, you know, the the Malcolm X's assassination was complicated for him, um, given what what we were talking about earlier in terms of that split, um, and I think. You know when he he really was forced to make a choice ali between elijah muhammad and the nation of islam on the one hand and malcolm x on the other um and i don't think that was an easy choice um but i think that you know it's it's in that moment when when malcolm was killed um there's a a strangeness to ali's behavior around it i mean the day of his funeral he wasn't there he was in boxing in an exhibition match at a Nation of Islam event. Um, and when Malcolm X split from the Nation of Islam, Ali was um, pretty, you know, he said some um, things about Malcolm X that were, uh, if not exactly critical, then, 
you know, he was definitely distancing himself. And I think as we were talking about before, you know, he came later very much to regret that, I think, as he did his own explorations and came to some of the same conclusions that that Malcolm X had earlier. Um, but, you know, I think that he was certainly, I, I don't know the specifics about his reactions to, to any of those other moments, um, but he was certainly paying attention to all that was going on in that period. And I'm sure deeply affected by each of those moments. The world of sort of uh, active athlete activism, we, we see kind of a, a bunch of it now. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there is more of a, you know, perhaps in the aftermath of, of Colin Kaepernick's taking a knee, which was, you know, hugely controversial in some places. I mean, he certainly paid a very, stiff price for taking his stands, but other people have really sort of taken up that that struggle. I mean, I think we've seen it strongly in, in leagues like the WNBA and the NBA. A number of very prominent athletes have, have really um, taken that as something that they feel that they should do. This was not true for decades after the, the 60s. There was almost a, a uh, active discouragement, I think, for athletes to, to speak publicly. I uh, wonder what you think, what sense you think Ali would make of, of, of sort of the, the, the current moment? Uh, is it a moment or is it is it something that's here to stay? I think that uh, Ali would be supportive of athletes who were doing something um, based on their convictions. And they felt this was, they felt this so strongly that they felt they had to make a public demonstration of their convictions. I think he would be supportive of that and uh, feel that that the athlete has a right to, to do that. Um, the, um, today uh, is a different situation than it was in the 60s and 70s. Um, you have to remember that um, um, in professional sports, there were really, they didn't have the kind of labor unions that they have now. And that has made a significant, a, a really terrific difference. Uh, in baseball, um, Kurt Flood, who was inspired by Muhammad Ali, um, took a stand against the um, reserve clause in baseball when he refused to be traded in 1969. He wasn't the first player to take a stance against the um, reserve clause. And eventually the reserve clause would be broken, but not by um, Kurt Flood. But it was another example of Ali's rever rever reverberations um, by his inspiring Kurt Flood. And you know, every I think people, uh, athletes are coming um, to this thing now, wanting to show a certain kind of um, of um, uh, commitment and a certain sense of their convictions, because athletics has changed over time. First of all, there's so much more money in it um, than it was in the '60s. It's it's it's, it's a multi-billion-dollar industry. Um, athletes are paid generally much better now than they were then. Um, the expansion of sports in the United States has just been enormous since the 1960s. Um, and so this, this has changed the position of the athlete in our country in a lot of ways uh, with the enormous amount of money, the enormous amount of attention and so forth um, that athletes get now compared to um, um, in the past. And I do think that in some ways they feel, I think many athletes, especially athletes of color, black athletes, uh, in some ways feel as much pressure, if not more pressure, to show that they are aligned um, with people and their concerns, uh, even more so than back in the 60s or in the 50s, um, because people are looking at athletes now who are making enormously, enor you know, sums of money that people couldn't imagine. They can't make in their whole, and they worked every day of the, in their whole lives, they would not make this kind of money that an athlete makes, many athletes make in a year. So I do think that the money and these sorts of things have also, I think, um, intensified for some athletes a, a, a necessity to feel, to show a certain sense of commitment um, 
to Black people and um, to the cause of social justice. I'm going to ask just one more question, and then I want to uh, invite our audience to uh, ask some questions that, that uh, David McMahon, our David McMahon, will be uh, posing to our, our panelists. But my final question goes, goes to you, Sarah, and it's this. So you, you mentioned earlier that this was about sort of eight years in incubation, and, you know, a creative project of this magnitude is, is a, you know, it's a universe to take on, and it's such a deep, immersion and it's you know it's probably putting a lot of saying no to a lot of other things that are appealing and uh so I'm, I'm curious you know now that you have birthed this this documentary film and it is out and you've had this this whole process how has your view of muhammad ali changed do you like him more or less than you did when you started out uh what sense do you have of him sort of globally now that maybe mm. you didn't have a year or two into the process? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, every project we take on is always going to be a huge learning experience, whether you start from some knowledge of the subject or next to none. Um, we're in a lot of ways starting from scratch and trying to understand the person or subject that we're taking on. Um, and that's the great fun of what we do is the opportunity to have that learning experience and to to get to know a subject i was i didn't know that much about muhammad ali before i mean you can't not know about muhammad ali but uh, you know my my knowledge of ali before starting this project was i think superficial um and so for me personally it's been a, an amazing journey to kind of get to know him and the amazing thing about him the great luck that we had though it's not really luck uh was in working on this project is how is just the sheer volume of archival material there is in this case i mean he's got to be one of the most well documented people in the 20th century and so we collected more than 15,000 photographs and that's just the ones that we actually entered into our log for our editors to use there were many many more that we looked at um, more than 500 hours of footage and that allows us to in addition to reading books and articles and and doing all this other research that we always do uh to get to know him through that footage both the you know the news footage giving speeches and talking to reporters and also that more intimate stuff like the the cornflake scene that you see at the beginning the kind of intimate family moments that you occasionally get a glimpse of um to really get to know him and that's a, a wonderful part of the process um there are a couple of things that struck me, I think, in in learning the story. One, the first thing was just as soon as we started talking about making this film and telling people that's what we were working on, what we discovered was that everyone has a Muhammad Ali story. Like, it felt like every person we were, oh, what are you working on? Muhammad Ali, oh. And they had this moment as a kid, they bumped into him on a street corner, he signed an autograph, they sent him a letter, he wrote them back. Like, he that was the thing that that first struck me in the beginning of this process was beginning to understand the just the incredible impact that he had on so many people in so many different ways and it was both because of the ways that he inspired people um his courage in standing up to the draft um his his bragging his you know his playfulness his cleverness his rhyming all these things but also the way that he shared himself with other people um, in this incredibly generous way. He would stay to sign every last autograph. I mean, he loved the crowds and that, you know, he he had the ego and he sort of fed that, you know, he's he's like on the one hand, a narcissist and on the other, this incredibly generous, loving person who just shared himself with everyone he encountered. And it is a quality that I think is uh rare and really special and it was clear from the moment we started working on this what kind of impact he had had on like literally millions of people uh in that way it's it, it was really extraordinary i think the other thing just kind of thematically that's that stood out to us in in working on this and it was really important to us as we were putting this sort of arc of the story together was in thinking about ali's life and his experience as a spiritual journey um, and understanding the role of 
Islam in his life throughout his life as it evolved, you know, in different ways, but that that is something that was influencing so much about the choices he made and what he did and his life. And I think we don't always think about him in that context. And I think for me, that was an important thing to um, take in and really understand about who he was. Well, I just, I just love the way that you and all of your films and all of your work just embrace complication always mm -hmm. because that's that's always the hard path right it's 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 so much easier to sort of stick with a, a thesis and go with it but it's it's things are not uh, the world's much more complicated than that and it's just plunging into that area of gray and complication is the you know is the richness of all these stories and you, you just do it so brilliantly so thank you both so much for this really rich and fascinating and compelling conversation. And I want to turn it over to our David McMahon to see if we can get some questions from the audience. We have about 15 minutes uh, to do so. Thank you, Marty. And um, I think we'll begin. Um, we have a few questions uh, related to on a few points that Sarah just brought up in her, in her reflection there. Um, and these have to do with Ali as a communicator, uh, both mm -hmm intimately, but also on the grander scale. Um, and Bess writes, uh, what what do you think from his background uh, or Ali's, Ali's be beliefs or character uh, that gave him, uh, in her words, the audacity to project such confidence and power with his words? Uh, it's a good question and I'm not sure we'll ever know exactly, but I think the simplest answer is that he was born with it, you know, that this is, that he had, um, you know, I think he was in a, a really fascinating mix of both of his parents, um, his mother, who was this um, loving, sort of happy person who who brought people to her, who was, um, I think, loved by everyone who encountered her, it seems. And his father, who was this charismatic performer. You know, he loved to sing, he loved to clown, he loved to, you know, create characters and, um, you know, he was um, complicated also. He drank too much and he was abusive at times to his wife. And, you know, there's, there's a lot more to the story, but I do think that in terms of Ali's personality, I think he got this interesting mix from both of his parents. Um, the that that sort of sense of performance of charisma of um showmanship from his father and then that kind of generosity of spirit from his mother and you see that i mean the, the accounts of him as a child suggest that he was really always like that um he was um engaging people always people wanted to be around him always um, and then I think to follow up on that, and I'll direct this to uh, Dr. Early, um, could you speak a little bit, especially to the significance of his rhetoric and his bombast as a, as a black man in the 60s and, 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 and the significance of that at that time, um, both globally, but uh, especially in the, at, at, at domestically in, in the American context of the period? Well, <clears throat> um, he was... Um is his bragging and so forth was not unique in, in the world of sports. Um, there have been other people who were, who bragged a lot and things like that, who made their personalities uh, this way. It was unique for a black person at this time to uh, be an athlete and to brag in the way he was bragging. Um, I think that he uh, came along and felt in some ways that he was something new. Um, he was the new generation. He was not Joe Lewis. He was not Jesse Owens. He was not those people, those black, great black athletes who had come before and who had uh, expressed a certain kind of humility and so forth. I think he consciously went about crafting himself in the way he did because he wanted to be different from those people. He wanted to present himself as a different kind of personality than people had seen with black, the great black athletes before. Um, in some respects, I suppose he was something like in, 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 in his outspokenness about certain things, he was something like Paul Robeson. But in other ways, um, the banter that he had and, and um, the poetry and all that sort of stuff, 
came from, you know, different sources. He was influenced by Gorgeous George, the wrestler. He was um, influenced by other people in co popular culture. He was influenced by black disc jockeys who, uh, personality disc jockeys who were always had a whole lot of pattern and things like that. So a lot of different uh, rhetorical black and white rhetorical sources um, influenced him and um, helped him to shape his personality and to reach people. Ali was, you know, understood himself as being sort of a showman and he, and he exercised this uh, in a certain kind of way. And he continued to be the showman even after he joined the Nation of Islam and decided he was going to say all these sort of racial truths um, after he joined the nation. Before this, he actually pretty much tried to avoid it, talking about race before he joined the Nation of Islam, and he, and he rarely ever did it. Um, so I think that his, his, what he came with was, you know, people have said, oh, he was the, the prototype or, the, or, the, or, the, or a kind of a, a, um, a early figure of a rapper or something like that with some of the things he was doing. And this is true, I mean, to, to the degree that um, Black audiences particularly liked the way he expressed himself and liked the kind of pattern that he had and the kinds of things he was doing. Many younger Black people liked it because it was something that was reminiscent of Black rhetorical styles in the Black community. So um, that was something that I think particularly younger Black people liked. Uh, older Black people were a little bit more mixed about it. But um, uh, I would say that he opened up a way for Black people to talk in public and opened up a way for a Black public figure to talk to people uh, that hadn't been done before. And, um, and so in this respect, I think he really broke new ground. Thank you. Um, we have another question from the audience um, asking uh, for a panelist to shed perhaps a bit of light uh, further light on how the nation of influence, nation of in, in Islam influenced Ali, um, especially as a younger person, um, and, and with his, providing a sense of uh, family and community, but also in what ways their message and at the time of his involvement, um, how they might resonate for him as a young black man in terms of black nationalism and self determination. Do you want to take that, Gerald, or you want me to? <laughs> uh, I'll say something. Um, the nation, the message of the nation, uh, I went to nation meetings when I was a teenager, and the, and the message of it was very appealing. If you were a certain age as a Black person and you heard this, um, because the message explained so much about the way the world was and why Black people were in the position that they were in. And uh, here was the nation coming along saying, okay, about the so-called Negro and the position that you're in, and the position that you're in is because you want to integrate with these white people, and you feel as though you have some kind of future being with these white people. And you don't understand, when you wake up, you will understand that you don't have a future with these white people, and that you have, and, and you have to go and make your own future and be your own person and recreate yourself. Um, you have to, in fact, re, you have to be reborn. And, and that's, that's that, that whole principle about being reborn is something that is in a lot of religious experiences that you, if you join and you convert, you're reborn. But with this, it was being reborn, not only in a spiritual way, but that you were awakened as a black person and that you understood yourself um, as a black person and that you understood that you had no future with white people, that your whole so sojourn with white people was either some form of punishment for black people that has come to an end. Uh, it has been an abomination, it's been, but you have no future with them because they have no future because God is getting rid of them. You know, it's, it, God is, you know, there's a spaceship that's filled with, and God is gonna get rid of them and you have no future with them. So that kind of talk in the early and mid sixties um, was enormously, you know, if you uh, 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 um, effective because at the time when integration, when, you know, you had the marches and integration was happening, 
um, immediate, oh, well, pretty close to immediate, immediate. The backlash against it was so severe that, you know, many black people said, well, this isn't going to work. Integration, this seems to be clear, that's not going to work. I mean, we're giving that a go and that's not going to work. And so what the nation was talking about was something that I think a lot of young black people um, thought, oh, okay, this is something that we can build. And this is something that I can build myself up with and I can make, I can unify myself with my people. And I think that that message was just enormously attractive because that message historically with black people has always been an attractive message. Build for yourself, do for yourself. That's what Elijah Rabbit always do for yourself and all that. that those were enormously attractive um, messages. And they were coming from local ministers in these mosques who were pretty charismatic. Malcolm X wasn't the only good speaker. And um, it was, uh, and it, it just, it was very attractive. You, it gave you this idea of the black community almost as a kind of utopia. You join this. And you had this kind of identity and this sense of connection that was enormously appealing. Yeah, I think there's also the the fact that I, I agree that and that um, you know there's this this message too of being special, of being you know chosen and better than. And I think for Ali, for young Cassius Clay, this kid who's always felt like he was destined for something special, who was going to be the greatest. Um, I imagine that that part of the message would have resonated with him too. living in a society that is constantly telling him that he is less than in these various ways. And here's this group that's saying, no, we are more than we are the best. And that, you know, I, I can I can see why that would have been appealing to him. And also, you know, he's incredibly young, right? I mean, he's you know, he's he's close in age to Emmett Till and clearly the murder of Emmett Till deeply affects him. He's really, um, as so many people were, but I mean, feeling feeling a connection to Emmett Till himself being, you know, about six months apart in age. And then not long after that, as a teenager, he goes to Chicago for a Golden Gloves tournament and he comes back with this record. This is, we think, the, his first exposure to the ideas of the Nation of Islam. And it's a record that is a recording of this song by sung by Louis X, who became Louis Farrakhan, called The White Man's Heaven is a Black Man's Hell. And that was the, his sort of first idea um, or sense of the message of the Nation of Islam. And he listened to that apparently over and over again as a teenager. Um, and so he's he's sort of taking this message in and, and hearing it. And so by the time he gets to Miami and starts actually going to a mosque and going to, to meetings, Nation of Islam meetings, he's got this this idea about um, where the Nation of Islam is is coming from and what it's what it's saying to him. Um, that's really appealing. That really is. That's a fascinating connection. The Emmett Till, young Cassius Clay connection and how they were of, of same similar generation and how the impact that that had and for our younger people in the audience a number of our students that maybe is not a name that is familiar but there are a number of people who who believe that that the the killing of Emmett Till which was just absolutely brutal and then documented with those horrific pictures that were published, I believe, in Jet magazine, and you know, at the behest of his his mom, who very courageously wanted this this coffin to be open after hit, you know, that her son was just absolutely brutalized and had this cotton gin of all things, this blade from this cotton gin wrapped around his neck. I mean, just horrific, loaded, almost inhuman-looking skull. And that moment, I think, was one that for a number of people in the country. Uh, put a sense of the brutality of white supremacy right there in a way that that you could not deny. Um, you know, more so perhaps even than the images from Birmingham in '63 with the the lurching German shepherds and the, the fire hoses directed at young kids. You know, it was it was almost like a live streaming in the 1950s. You know, a, a akin for its own era to the you know the Derek Chauvin knee on George Floyd's neck. So that moment, what a, what a critical moment and, and fascinating to sort of think of a young Muhammad Ali of being at, you know, really at the same point in his life. So did he, did he talk much, if at all, about, about Emmett Hill, Sarah? Is that 
Yeah, I mean, he did that. You know, we didn't have a lot on, on camera of him talking about it, but he definitely, you know, there are accounts, I think he wrote about it. I mean, his, his autobiography wasn't really written by him, but I mean, it's definitely in there. And, um, you know, his family members talked about that, what an impact it had on him. He definitely talked about that, um, just how, um, yeah, just the impact that it had on him as a, you know, 14, 14 year old. Um, just how horrifying that was and and as you said you know that these these images were seen really widely and i think were absolutely shocking to people um but i think for ali in particular being the same age as till i think he saw himself in emmett till um and i think that was uh particularly gut-wrenching for him and clearly something that stuck with him uh, he continued talking about for many years Um, as sort of a preamble to probably our last question, I'd ask, I'd ask you to comment a little bit. One of the things that struck me, even in the snippet, it struck me when I saw it in, in the full documentary, but it, it replayed in the snippet and it struck me again. There's that image of uh, Ali speaking to the displaced Mujahideen from Afghanistan. And here you have the sort of principled, conscientious objector of the, of the Vietnam War, uh, you know, articulating in a very clear way, given all his bombast, one of the pieces that always strikes me is, you know, why am I going to go over there and shoot somebody who essentially has never done anything to me on the one hand and sort of articulating a very principled response to the draft and, and, and the implications for him as a black man in the United States. And then, you know, a, a generation later, they're speaking passionately in support of the Mujahideen who are, you know, spiritual warriors, who are trying to throw off, um, you know, the Russian or the Soviet invaders at the time, and then thinking of our own complex history with that area and, and our relationship to these wars. You know, he he. One of the one of the wonderful things about the documentary is it really brings out all these contrasts that are contained with with within Ali, and some of those find a resolution, and some of them those are not. They're just the 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 the. Um, you know, the inconsistencies of human life, um, they add up. But but looking at, to close then with this question from our audience, um, you know, what is the through line uh, that you, uh, Sarah and, 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 and Dr. Early, what, what is the through line you see in terms of Ali's uh, own approach to social activism, but also the through line in how that inspires and continues in the work of today's activists? Um, well, one one brief note about the the footage that you just brought up. Um, one interesting thing, which is not necessarily clear um, in the documentary, is the fact that Osama bin Laden actually was in that audience. Um, and you know, of course, this is before we you sort of know the full trajectory of that. Um, but I think that that also speaks to that moment. Speaks to as as you're asking about this larger trajectory and and meaning of Ali. And I think really the thing that you know he certainly evolves across his life. Um, but I think the thing that is always true about him is that he is authentically himself and that he insists on this thing, this, you know, this moment after he defeats Sonny Liston and the next day he has this press conference and he seems like a new person and he says, I'm free to be who I want to be. I can say what I want to say and think what I want to think. Um, and this is a hugely important moment. And I think in some ways he's always been himself. Um, whether it's the young guy who's who's bragging um, or whether it's this older man who has essentially lost his voice due to Parkinson's and who is spreading his religion around the world, um, that he is actually authentically himself all the time. And the some of the risks he takes, you know, his his courage in refusing the draft and his willingness, as you saw in the clip, you know, he says he would go before machine gun fire before he would give up his religion. I think all of these moments in the end reflect that insistence on being free to be himself, on being authentically himself, which is an extraordinary thing. And when we think about him in the context of even just athletes speaking out, um, you know, what he was risking and willing to give up um, is on 
a scale that we have rarely seen. And I think when you see some of the other athletes that went before who had to, as Gerald was mentioning earlier, you know, a Joe Lewis, who was sort of encouraged to keep quiet in certain ways, to not celebrate in certain ways in order to achieve what he was going to achieve. And Ali said, no, I'm going to achieve this, but I'm going to do it my way. And when people did not like that, he was going, he was prepared to um, face the, the consequences of that, but he was always going to be himself. And I think that's what makes him to this day such an inspiring figure, whether you're inspired by his draft resistance or any of these other aspects of his life. Um, I think a lot of it goes to that authenticity. Yeah, I just, I want to thank everyone for participating in this. It has really been a, a fascinating and energizing conversation and just you know thank you for your your eloquence for your magnificent storytelling um, for your commitment to these issues that are so important to all of us and for to to both of you professor early and and sarah burns for taking the time to to really shed some light for our community here in a place where it, it needs to shine and we need to keep it shining and uh really so so appreciate you taking the time to be with us great great documentary and a great conversation tonight thank you thank you